Hello everybody, this is Charles1K92 here, also known as GM65 from the PlayStation Store Network. So, this is it, here we are. If you're wondering what this video is, the title should be enough. This is a Kingdom Hearts 3 weekly countdown video. At the time of this recording, it is now the 28th of October. When this video is out, it will be the 27th of November which it is today. So, why am I doing a weekly countdown video? This is to explain. It has been a very long time since Kingdom Hearts had a numbered release title, since 2006 to be more precise. So now, what I'm doing is I'm doing a weekly countdown video, as I've just said. Now, you're wondering, well, why start on the 27th of November when the game comes out on the 29th of January for the rest of the world, but let's say 25th of January for Japan? Well, I'm going to represent the rest of the world here and say I would like to do this video, these videos, should I say, in order to make Kingdom Hearts a little bit more sense to those of us who may or may not know the whole story. So... This video is going to begin with the game that basically started it all. And this is Kingdom Hearts 1. This video is going to just be about Kingdom Hearts 1. But I can't just start the video and just say, right, let's get down to it with the whole adventure and everything else that the first game brings. Can't do that. We have to go from the beginning. And from beginning, I mean real beginning. So it's not like anything mythological, uh, mythological about this. It's just how a group of individuals came together, ironically enough, in an elevator somewhere in Japan or in America, most likely. Not too sure where this took place, but it took place somewhere in an elevator. So, <clears throat> I don't know who the Disney representative was, so I'm just going to refer to this person as the Disney rep. Now you have the director of Kingdom Hearts, who is Tasuya Nomura. This man is partly, well, is the main reason for the Final Fantasy series. And um, he's also the main man responsible for Kingdom Hearts and anything Kingdom Hearts. Uh, there's also another person, which is um, Shinshi Hashimoto. He is a producer. Along with, um, on this occasion, I think producers change over each game. But there's a second person here, who is Yoshiori uh, Kitetse, I think it might be. I'm not too sure. If I've butchered this person's name, let me know. Anyway, so, way back when, in the beginning of early 2000s to the late 1990s, Disney and Squaresoft, as it was known back then, didn't have any form of collaboration. There was no, as far as I understand, there was nothing that links them at this current point. Now during this time, Nintendo was king. It had the Nintendo 64, which was reigning supreme all over the world because of the games that it had. It had like Super Mario, it had uh, the Mario, the Super Mario World thing. It had the Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. I think Star Fox had something similar along with other things. So from Disney's standpoint, Disney wanted to have well, a game having this sort of setup, an open world experience. Something similar to Grand Theft Auto, if you can think about it, where you have a map, you can explore it to your heart's content, and that's generally it. Heading over to Squaresoft, which was Square, which, which is technically Square Enix today. So they, re they would have done a Final Fantasy project at that current point, and they were coming up with a new style of gameplay. Something similar to maybe what Nintendo done with Mario on Nintendo 64. Now you can just imagine like the you know the the irony of it that you know you've got two separate organizations wanting to do roughly the same thing. Disney has stepped its toe in the gaming industry in the past with other gaming titles, but mainly their games would mainly be like 2D scrollers or racing games or a game which is based on a movie that they want to gain capital on, like franchise it and whatnot. But again, these games probably never made a lot of money so it was only a select few people that would go and buy the game and the turnover wouldn't be that very good and plus also the game's quality wouldn't be great either so it'd be just not rushed but there's no detail so they met in the elevator 
Now, I'm not too sure who came up with the artwork, but I'm going to assume it's Nomura-san who came up with this. He had a concept for what we know as our main protagonist, Sora. So, like, he had an art drawing. And this Disney guy was chatting to the Japanese team, right, to, to well, Squaresoft. And he noticed the picture, like, the drawing. Thought, hmm, that looks pretty good. Do you fancy doing a game with us? I'm not saying that's what it was like word for word, but that's to sum it up. So eventually they must have had meetings. Now Sora's original form, so I'd recommend you go and Google Sora in his Kingdom Hearts 1 attire. You'll see just a boy, spiky hair, has his weapon, has a red um, onesie, shorts, uh, big yellow boots, and um, a blue and white hoodie top thing with a necklace and a chain. Now, Sora's original form, his original look, he was supposed to be a human slash lion hybrid. So what that means is he has more lion features. So let's put it into this context. So in his teeth, let's say, he won't just have human teeth, he'll have like lion fangs. His hands will have claws. Uh, he'll have a few like tufts of fur here and there. Uh, his hair wouldn't necessarily just be like normal hair, it'd be like a liony kind of mane look. And he has, uh, he has a weapon, but it wouldn't be the weapon that we know that he would have had today. His weapon would have been a, a sword that has a little keychain at the end, similar to what he has now, but it's not a normal sword, it's a chainsaw sword. Now, when Disney looked at this, they said, listen, we like the character, but he can't have that weapon because we know it's Disney. Disney is all about that family-friendly stuff. So Squaresoft at the time went, okay, we'll come back to you with this, but anything else... And this, we're not too sure about the lion hybrid part either, so can we just have him be a normal boy? So they went, okay, well, we've done that in the past, so why not? And then comes down the argument for Disney properties. Now, Disney gave licenses to Square Soft about certain films that they could use as worlds in Kingdom Hearts 1. So you have Tarzan, right? That's only in Kingdom Hearts 1. It never comes back in any other game except Kingdom Hearts 1. You have Beauty and the Beast, although they don't have a world, but they have the right to use the characters of that world. They had the same thing with Cinderella, Snow White, Aladdin, and so on. So I can give a good list, but in the sake of time, I'm not going to go too much. So they then have the properties, they then have the licensing. And then it comes down to the fact of, well, the story. So they have to take bits and pieces from each world, well, from each Disney film, and incorporate it into a world and give a story of why our main character had to go there right so that's the narrative you go to the place you rescue it and you go back afterwards you know to collect like collectibles and stuff anyway so it isn't just limited to the films we actually get to have the main mascots from disney themselves so if i turn around and said to you people on this youtube now if i said to you disney name me three famous disney characters that are not from the film but just from disney alone one would most likely be the mouse himself, Mickey. The next will probably be Goofy, and the last will probably be Donald, the duck. Now, the game has these guys portrayed in a certain way. Goofy is the king's royal guard. Donald is the king's royal mage. Now, the king is Mickey, obviously, because he's the king of the Disneyland, or Disney Castle. Now, for the narrative of the story, we don't actually get to see Mickey till the very end. I'm not going to say, like, spoiler alert, because I think by now it's not that too hard to figure out that you can't see him till the very end. But Mickey's adventure is for him to go and find what's going wrong with the world. Right? That's the whole point. There's something happening in the world of Kingdom Hearts where stuff's going wrong. But Mickey's going out to find something, but there is another thing that somebody else will have, and it's Donald and Goofy's job to stay with this person. So that was their mission, and they had to do that. But now let's actually get into the story of uh, Kingdom Hearts. So, the story of it is generally this. is about a young boy and his two best friends. Alright, three kids. Now, they live on an island which is called Destiny Islands. Alright, so that's where they come from. But before we get to that island, we must go through a sequence. It's a dream sequence that only ha that happens at the beginning of this game. It does happen in the sequel game, but we're going to mainly focus on this one. So our main, so we get a glorious intro to the game, all done in CG at the time, and then we get the actual gameplay itself. 
Now, our main protagonist, which is Sora, is standing in a very strange dark world. But he stands on a glass stained tiled floor, or window pane floor, which has got like this church cathedral type of theme. Not like song, but like the setting. So it's like very kind of religious in some sense. So, there's a background voice which happens when you are watching, when you're reading the cutscene, and you're seeing like this text come across the top of the screen. Now, I've got a feeling who this character is, and I won't say until I get to the Birth by Sleep game, when I have to explain on what I, who I think it is. And it probably would make sense to once she made the connection. So, I believe this voice, at this moment when we play the game, it's the narrator, it's us. If you read this out loud, it kind of makes sense. So, you then have to learn how to move Sora around. So basically, this is the point in time when you get to move him left, right, up, down, back, forth, and so on even with the camera position. You also get to learn how you interact with the world. Objects that you can pick up, objects that you can throw, objects that you can smash, and so on. And how to open up treasure chests, because, you know, that's the whole thing. So eventually, Sora does these things, and he progresses fur further and further through, like opening a few doors, falling through a few things, and then eventually having to make a choice. Now, these choices are basically the pathways of what you choose to do. It's up to you as the player. You have a sword, you have a staff, and you have a shield. You have to choose one to be your main source of, let's say, power. If you choose the sword, then you're going to go for strength. If you choose the mage, like the staff, you're going to mainly aim for your magic. Or if you want the shield, it'll mainly be your tank. It'll be like, well, it'll be like you being having extra defense points, which means if someone hits you, you don't take that much damage. But you also have to sacrifice something as well afterwards. We then get thrown into combat where we have to face these little shadow creatures, which I'll say what they are soon. You beat them, you then face a bigger version of them, which is the boss, and then we get to go to Destiny Islands. We meet up with one of Sora's best friends, which is Kairi. She is Sora's love interest. We also meet Riku, who is his best friend and is about a year older than him. There's also three other people that are on this play island of Destiny Islands. Which is Tidus Waka, Waki, is it Waka or Waki? I think it's Waka. And I think it's Selfie or Selfie? I'm not too sure how to pronounce her name. But these characters are from Final Fantasy X. And it's a bit of a, an Easter egg because Kingdom Hearts 2 came out after. No, Kingdom Hearts 1 came out, I think, after Final Fantasy X. I'm, I'm not, I think so. Or maybe they were like teased, I don't know. I didn't pay. I, I would say I paid attention, but not that much. Anyway. So, Sora's job, while he's awake, he has to go and find resources for the raft that they're building because they want to go and see other worlds. So the concept of Kingdom Hearts is this. You don't just have one world that you live on. There are actually more worlds out in the universe, right? And Riku and Sora and Kairi come to an agreement that they actually want to go and travel. They want to see more of not just their world, but the rest of the worlds which you think oh that's nice so you're planning on sailing there that's a that's a good idea anyway so the first day goes off without a hitch really so you know it's good then day two now this is where a bit of mysteriousness comes in Sora has to go and gather a few more resources before they actually leave because they've already finished the raft they just need food so Sora's job is to go around and collect bits of food he then goes into a place which is called the secret place. It's basically a little cave that they found on the island. They've already doodled on there, like drawn pictures and whatnot, and Sora finds a mushroom that he has to, you know, that he wanted to pick anyway. So while he's there, he comes across a picture that he and Kyrie drew when they were very little. Now, Sora decides to do something very nice. He draws a star-shaped symbol that he hands to Kyrie. Now, on this island, there is a fruit tree. And it's called the Paupu fruit. It's basically a little star-shaped fruit. That's probably a very crap interpretation of the star, but you know what I mean. And this star fruit has got a special legend about it. It says if you are to share this fruit with anybody that you like, you and this person's destinies are then intertwined. They're linked. So it becomes like you and this person share a bond. You share a very deep connection. 
and Riku kind of teased Sora about this, I think, the night, be the day before. So it's just like, I know that you wanted one, so why don't you go and share it with Kairi and whatnot. But Sora doesn't say this to Kairi because I think he's a bit shy. He's got this, like, he wants to tell her that he likes her, but like most boys, it takes a bit of courage to actually say that you how you feel. Unless you're a badass, then you just go and do it. But anyway, so after this day, well, on this day, Sora is Sora gets this strange feeling that somebody's watching him. He turns around. Now, when you play the game, you get to see the person that he's talking to. But I'm going to take this from Sora's perspective. Sora, I think, doesn't see the person straight away. This cave is actually quite dark, I'm, I, I'm guessing. So, you know, who's, who's there? Who are you? This person then comes out with a line, which I'm not too sure if I can actually come across this. But, um, let's see. Um... He says that this world has been connected and that it's tied to the darkness and, ev and, and everything else. Now, Sora at this time doesn't know what the hell this person's saying. He says, well, I don't know what you're on about. Uh, but then it kind of penny drops to Sora. It's like, wait a minute, you must, come, you must be from another world. How did you get here is the question. But then this man kind of belittles Sora's somewhat thought process. Says, well, you don't seem to understand anything, do you? So if you can't understand anything, then you mustn't understand anything at all. One who knows nothing can understand nothing, is the word, is the phrase. So then Sora kind of gets a bit pissed. It's like, well, I'm going to learn everything that's out there. And when I do, I'll understand it all. Okay, well, that's a meaningless effort, but go ahead. But there's something that mysterious happens. In this cave, there is a wooden window. Well, by wooden window, I'm talking, let's just say, something that's etched in the rock face or the wooden face of a, inside the cave. And it's shaped as a doorway. But here's the thing. There's no doorknob, there's no keyhole, there's nothing. It's just a big, solid chunk of wood. But there's a noise coming from beyond it. Sora looks. Looks back. The man's gone. Now... For the sake of, let's say, you being a Sora, once you have control, you can actually interact with stuff then. But you go up to the door and you interact with it. Sora actually says this in his head. Strange. Where did this man come from? He couldn't have come from the door. This isn't word for word. But he couldn't have come from here because this is a solid thing. There's no way to open it or push it or pull it open. So where the hell did he come from? Sora puts this to the back of his mind and chooses to focus on the raft that they're finishing up. Finally... They do have this conversation. I'm not too sure if this is the, the first day or if this is the second day. But Riku does kind of lament to say that Kairi is the inspiration for Riku wanting to leave Destiny Islands. And the question, the reason why that is, is because there's a bit of a breaking into the, like say, the time of where Kairi comes from. She doesn't come from their world. She doesn't, she, she wasn't born there. She came from a different place. But yet, she managed to get to where Sora and Riku are. So that's kind of like, hmm, well, if she managed to get here, very small, on her own, we must be able to do this, and there has to be a way. So, that's their plan. Now, Kairi, the night before they choose to leave, says this to Sora, that she doesn't want Sora to change. She wants Sora to stay as he is. The lovable teenage boy who's quite naive, bit goofy she wants him to stay the way he is but Sora realizes that Kairi's changed a little bit and he says well if I if you don't want me to change then you shouldn't change either I mean I like you the way you are which is kind of like Sora maybe admitting that he does you know like her in a sense so they go to bed or at least they go home Sora is thinking about the day when he has to go like the day that they have to leave can't get to sleep probably but he realises, by looking out his window, there's a massive storm on the island. And he's more concerned about the raft. So he does his, he does his duty, he has to go. His mother then says, Sora, dinner's ready. She goes upstairs, Sora, he's gone. He arrives on the small island, only to find that the shadow creatures that he faced in his dream are now on the island. He tries to fight them off, 
but he can't. He then finds Re he then sees a door which is blocking the entrance to the secret cave. Can't open it. He then goes to see Riku, who's standing at a place where he saw and Kairi always hang out. And then Riku says that the door is open and that they can finally go. And that Riku isn't afraid of the darkness and he's ready to sac he's ready to go. Sora isn't too sure. He tries to reach for Riku, but then these dark tendrils come up and basically attach themselves to both of them. And then a mysterious light comes. Riku disappears, but Sora is left on the island. Sora is now holding a mythical weapon known as a Keyblade. Now this Keyblade is known as a Kingdom Key. A Keyblade is a very mysterious mythical item in Kingdom Hearts lore. These things have their own heart, and they also have their own mind. They cannot be picked up by anybody. They cannot be chosen by anybody. The Keyblade chooses you. If the Keyblade chooses you, then you are its rightful wielder. So if a stranger was to take, let's say, your Keyblade, and they were to hold it in their hand, the Keyblade will know that it doesn't belong to that person, and it will dematerialize and then rematerialize into your hand. Oh, and also the Keyblade as well can dematerialize and rematerialize whenever the wielder needs it. So, Sora then fights off these shadow creatures with this new sword, and realises that, that it works. He then finds Kairi in the mysterious, in the secret cave. Only she looks like she's very tired. It looks like she's been doing, she's been doing something in the cave. Nothing loony, no. She's been holding something back. When she turns to face Sora, her attention isn't towards the door that she was looking at. This is the same wooden door that I just mentioned. Next thing, the door flings open and a cascade of dark shadows and everything else pushes Kairi. Sora reaches out to grab her, only to find her to disappear. And then he gets flung out. When he gets pushed out of the cave, the island that he knew as his home is all but destroyed. The only thing that's probably left is this bit of land. And the boss that he faced in the beginning of the game is also there on his world. He then fights the creature off and defeats it, but I have to say it's not a very good victory. It's a Pyrrhic victory. It's going to come at a huge cost. Sora tries to hold on to a piece of wood or timber, but gets sucked up into this void. And then the world that he lived on was gone, swallowed by darkness. Meanwhile, Donald and Goofy have got a mission from King Mickey, which is to go and find somebody who has the key the kingdom key to be precise, and stay with them until they meet up with the king to save the worlds. Fair enough. They arrive, in a new, they arrive at another world called Travers Town. Goofy notices by looking up that a world has just been taken. Now this world is Sora's world. It's just been gone. Realising that they don't have much time, Donald and Goofy are looking for a man named Leon, so once they meet up with him, they'll be able to find out where to find the Keyblade Wielder, or the key. Sora is then found in an alleyway, unconscious, but when he comes to, thanks to, Diz, uh, ki, to, thanks to King Mickey's dog, Pluto, Sora thinks that he's dreaming, but he realises that he isn't. He then realises again that he's in another world. He then tries to talk to some people, but no, he's not getting much information. He then goes into an accessory shop, and there he meets one of the Final Fantasy VII characters named Sid. After speaking to Sid, Sid tells Sid is then informed and he's sorry that Sora's lost his world. Or, you know, because it's gone. And that uh, he says he's not too sure about where his friends are, and he says, Well look, sometimes when stuff like this happens, people come from different worlds that were lost and they end up coming like here to this place. So your best bet is to just look around here. They might have actually landed somewhere else in this part of the world, in this town. Have a look, and if you find them then bring them back here and we'll see what we can do. And then after this, Sora is basically, it's basically, you don't say like cat and mouse, but you just wander around. So once Sora goes from one district to the next, because it's broken into three districts, you've got District 1, which is where you start off with, District, district 2, and then District 3. Now, Sora goes in and he sees more of these shadow creatures, and one of them actually swallows up a heart from a living person, and is transformed into a different version of this shadow creature, which is wearing armour. You, find, you face off these creatures, and every single time you leave one section, Donald and Goofy come out of another one. So basically, it's a miss 
hat. You're not crossing your paths just yet. Sora then goes back to the accessory shop to say, listen, I can't find them, they're not here. Um, and then Sid says, well, look, I'm very sorry, but, you know, there's not much I can do. If you need it, if you need a place to stay, not say if you need a place to stay, but, you know, keep searching, you should be able to find them. But when Sora leaves, somebody turns around and says that the Heartless are going to keep hunting you, and they will always keep hunting you as long as you continue to wield the Keyblade. And this is actually Squall from Final Fantasy VIII, but due to licensing, he's known as Leon in Kingdom Hearts, is um, story. So, this is where the boss battle occurs. So, it can go down two ways. Option one, you lose the battle against Leon, and basically you're left unconscious and he just brings you to a safe place. Or, you actually beat Leon, but Sora doesn't have the endurance to keep himself awake. And, you know, Leon takes him back in and just, you know, tells him everything. He, Sora then wakes up and thinks he sees Kairi, but it isn't Kairi, it's actually Yuffie. This is a Final Fantasy VII character. She then tells Leon that I think he might have overdone it. So Leon says, look, don't, doesn't matter. And he explains everything to Sora about what the Keyblade is and what the creatures are that are hunting him are called. And they are called Heartless. Now, at this time, Donald and Goofy have met up with Erith. I think that's her name. She's also a Final Fantasy VII character. And she explains to them what's going on. And she knows about the king, because I suppose she's had correspondences with him. And they are trying to find out what the hell's going on. Now, the man named there's a man named Ansem who is responsible for these heartlesses to appear in the first place. She said that they, he was working on something, and then it went wrong, and he's apparently lost his mind, he's now causing chaos. So, Sora realises what he has to do, but he has to save his friends first, so his friends become a priority. After their little meeting, the Heartless find out where they are, and Sora fights his way through. You go up to District 3, and then you face off the first Armoured Heartless boss, which is, a, a, I think it's an Armoured one, or is it a thing? I can't remember the name. But you are with Donald and Goofy, and they, and they actually assist you for the first time. After this, they form their alliance, and basically the adventure begins with the three of them. So what happens is, to cut a very long story short, you travel from each individual Disney world. You solve that world's problem, that world becomes saved. Now what the Heartless are after is the heart of each world, because the more hearts they consume, the more powerful they get. The Keyblade has the ability to seal a world's heart off completely because a Keyblade has got this ability to open and close and lock and unlock anything. So, when Sora goes to a world and he finds the heart of the world, his key, the Keyblade will react and will instantly lock it. So it'll be just like, oh, this is new. I didn't know this, this had this ability. And then it produces like a gummy block, which is something which is for the gummy ship, which actually has the ability to travel to each individual world. Now, the reason why that is, is because the worlds are separated by, well, say barricades or barriers. And these are to keep the worlds safe from darkness. But the barriers have been disintegrating over time because darkness is becoming too powerful. So... What happens is, is that when Sora heals the world, the barriers and the borders are slowly being rebuilt. So it's not happening instantly, it's just taking time. This gets explained near the end game. So it literally can become impossible to travel to different worlds once everything goes back to normal. Because the worlds were meant to be separate anyway. They were never meant to be back together, not since, well, a major disaster happened. So, as you go through each world, you realise that there's a group of Disney villains that are causing the distress, and that they're after the seven princesses of heart. Now, six of these princesses are Disney princesses. So, you have Snow White, Jasmine, Belle, uh, Sleeping Beauty, Aurora, and Cinderella. So, that's six of them. Now, you're thinking, well, you said the seventh. So, where's the seventh? The seventh is Kyrie. Kyrie is one of the seven princesses of heart. She's not a Disney princess, but she is one because of her world that she comes from. Now, the last world, the second to last world that you go to is called Holobastium. It's basically a huge castle world. And 
Maleficent is one of their Disney villains that I, that's leading the charge of seizing power by using the seven princesses. The other villains are Captain Hook, you have Hades, Boogie Boogie from um, A Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, Ursula, mm, Jafar from Aladdin, and I think they're the only people. But Riku has ended up joining with Maleficent because he ended up going to Holobastion when he got sucked up. He did meet Sora in Travis Town when Sora went back to Travis Town, only to, re only to be told by Maleficent that Sora didn't need him anymore. That Sora's got new friends. Now, Riku then decides to go down this dark path and chooses to attack Sora when he and him meet again in Peter Pan's world, which is Neverland. Sora then feels slightly, you know, betrayed and tries to warn Riku that if you continue to use the darkness, if you continue to stay down this path, the heartless will just consume you. But then Riku turns around and says this, that will never happen. My heart's too strong and I won't let the darkness take me. So that's like, okay, so we now know that small fact. If you have a very weak heart that's very susceptible to darkness, you'll end up becoming a heartless. Mainly a shadow heartless. They're the small squishy things that we saw at the very beginning of the game. Anyway, at the very end, uh, Maleficent has all she needs. The other Disney villains were defeated by Sora in their respective worlds. Now Maleficent is at Hollow Bastion because her world was taken by the darkness as well. Now she has all the princesses there and she needs to open up the final door because the final door to the heart of that world won't open unless the seven princesses are in Hollow Bastion, which they are. But Kyrie's heart isn't in her, it's been taken. But she's not a heartless because princesses of heart are full of pure light. They can never have darkness in them. That's the whole point. Anyway, so Riku then meets up with Sora at Hollow Bastion when he uh, arrives. And Riku's facing uh, the beast from Beauty and the Beast. And Riku's technically kicking his ass. Sora then arrives and tells Riku to stop what he's doing and that, you know, this isn't right. But then here's the funny factor. The Keyblade that Sora has doesn't belong to him. It was never his. It belongs to Riku. Riku summons the Keyblade and it goes to him. And then Riku kind of belittles him and says, listen, you were just the delivery boy. Have fun with the toy sword. Be hero with that. The Beast and Sora are then left more or less kind of like, well, pissed. Donald and Goofy have to still follow their mission, but throughout the time that they were with Sora, they grew quite close to each other and they couldn't, it was a hard decision to make. Goofy was a bit, you know, confounded that he had to leave Sora. But Sora and the Beast still proceed up to the castle because the Beast's, well, princess, which is Belle, is in the castle. The Beast and Sora then come up to this, I'm going to say Grand Hall, where there's a staircase. And Riku tells Sora that, listen, you're still here? Why? You've got a very weak heart and everything else. But Sora says, yeah, that's true, but I've had experiences with other people and they've, you know, helped me become stronger. And so the coining the phrase, my friends are my power, resonates. Riku then says, okay, fine. Your heart against my Keyblade. We'll see. Your heart against my darkness. Riku then attacks Sora with a dark fire spell. And, um, well, Sora basically just hopes that whatever happens, happens soon. Goofy saves Sora by blocking the attack. And then he says, look, tell the king that I'm sorry that I betrayed his orders. I can't let somebody like this guy attack our friend. Donald agrees and says, listen, we're not going to let you do this. We're going to fight you and we're going to help this kid because we fought alongside him against loads of Heartless. And we've just joined you and you're kind of a dick. Riku doesn't give a shit and says, okay, fine, we'll fight. But then the Keyblade then makes a decision. This is where the sentience of the thing comes into play. It sees and recognises Sora to be its not say it's true master, the true master is Riku. Riku is technically supposed to be the one who has this Keyblade. But it goes back to Sora because Sora is more purer than Riku. Sora is taking it upon himself to sacrifice what is needed. Whereas Riku isn't. 
A boss battle incurs. You beat Riku and he flees. As Sora process goes through the castle, he then um, comes across, let's say, a few difficult puzzles and whatnot you have to solve. But Riku runs back into, let's say, this uh, assembly chamber hall where he and Maleficent spoke. Now, the same man that we saw in the very beginning, which is the, sh the hooded, hooded figure, is actually Ansem. He tells Riku to say, listen, at that moment when you faced off that kid, Sora, your heart was weaker, but I can do something for you. Which is, well, if you just open your heart to a little bit more to darkness, I can give you great power. I can give you so much strength that you'll be able to take that key away from him. Back. Riku's gullible. So it's okay, we'll do it. Sora meets up with Maleficent in the same room. Um, well, he doesn't meet up with her straight away. Maleficent's very pissed, realising that Kyrie isn't activating anything. Riku, who now has a mixed voice between him and Ansem, are now saying, well, I'll be able to do what's necessary and summons a new Keyblade. But Maleficent is, you know, she's surprised by this, but she's able to sense that Donald, Sora, Donald and Goofy are getting, are getting closer. And she says, look, I'll deal with these pests. You stay here and guard this chamber. Riku's like, sure, I can do that. That's easy. Maleficent challenges you to a boss battle. You kick her ass. She then flees. Sora and the gang pursue her. And she's very weakened. Riku then appears and says, do you need some help? And she says, no. So it's kind of like being defiant, like any boss character would be. And then Riku decides to do this. She says, listen, the power of darkness is great. I'll demonstrate it for you. The Keyblade is summoned and he stabs her literally in the heart, telling her, listen, open yourself to darkness a lot more, unlock your full potential and give in to it, become darkness itself. Riku then, then removes the blade, disappears, and then Maleficent transforms into her dragon form. Sora and gang beat her, and she becomes nothing more than, um, well, her robes, are just, her, ro her robes of what she wears is just left. And Riku then proceeds to stomp this into the ground and like say, well, she was nothing. She was just a pawn to me. So then Sora then realises that this isn't Riku talking. This is a different guy. He then, Sora then leaves, goes to the final room, sees Riku. Only to find that it isn't him. He says, well, it is I, Anson, the Seeker of Darkness. And I will be the one to open this door here once the princess's heart has been returned. Sora then is aching in pain, realising this, that Kairi's heart is actually with his. So this was when, when Kairi faded away in his arms at the beginning of the game, her heart went into his. So it came to a choice. Riku said, well, let's just say Ansem is talking here, not Riku. Ansem says, listen, give me, the, give me her heart, let me open this door, and, you know, things will be good. Just let me do it. And Sora knows that if this does happen, it's going to be very bad. I mean, we're talking like the end of everything. So he stops him. And then comes the greatest battle as far as I can say, because I've played through this. And like many of you who probably have played this and are watching this video, knows what I'm on about when we have to face Ansem Riku for the first, well, not, well, yeah, for the first time. Think about how we not think about the times when we couldn't skip through the cutscene and we had to literally watch it over and over again, and how good it felt once we beat him. But anyway, so once he's beaten, Riku actually disappears. It's just like he fades completely. But the Keyblade is left behind still, the one that Riku was holding. So Sora is planning to open to seal the door, but it's not going to work because well, Kairi's heart isn't in her. So then Sora thinks about it. And he looks at the Keyblade, and Riku did mention something which I didn't say, or at least Anton Riku said this. So the Keyblade that he's holding is the key to unlock people's hearts. So he picks it up and he's, he's like, I wonder. Sora then impales himself, causing him to basically give up his heart. And, well, that does happen. The heart, which is Sora's, is separated from Kairi's and they both kind of split. Now Sora's heart disappears completely. Kairi's goes back to hers, but that Keyblade didn't just hold Kairi's, it held the other princesses. Now when her heart went back into her to Kairi's, the door finally opened, it triggered. 
Sora then realised, Sora was glad to know that Kyrie was safe. And, well, he faded. He was just gone. And then Kyrie was upset knowing that, because she's been with Sora, like, technically soul to soul wise, she's been with him since they left Destiny Island, so she knows exactly how he feels and everything. Then, Ansem the Seeker of Darkness comes back, this time though more grown up, and says, well listen, thank you princess, but your part to play in this is now over, time to say goodbye. He then summons a load of Shadow Heartless, and Donald and Goofy try to protect Kyrie, and let's just say it's like, can we actually stop him? And Donald's like, I don't know, but we're going to at least try if we can. But then something strange happens. Ansem is prevented from moving any closer because Riku is now stop stepping in and says, I'm not going to let you use me for this. Run. The Heartless are coming. You don't stand a chance with this guy. Just get out. Leave. Meanwhile, while, these, while the gang leaves, there's a little Shadow Heartless which is just standing there perplexed. This shadow is actually Sora. Sora... Well, we get to play as a Shadow Heartless, basically, and we have to run our way through. No Heartless spawn at this time, because we are one. And we pursue Donald and Goofy. Sora then realises and sees them, and he tries to go up to them, but only with Donald kind of knocking his head with, the, with his staff, telling him, Just go away, you pest. We don't need you. Shoo. Kyrie then sees through the facade of this Shadow Heartless and thinks, knows it's Sora. She then hugs him once more Shadow Heartless appear and try to attack, and then Sora, you know, is revived. And they leave, and then they go back to um, Hollow Bastion to seal the final keyhole. And then another world is opened up. This world is called the End... I think it's the End of the World. And basically, this world is a heartless world. It's basically where the heart is constantly spawn. And where it is, it's in the blackest part... Well, not blackest, it's in the deepest, darkest area of their universe. And before they get there... Uh, Leon says this to Sora when they finally get to Radiant Garden because Sid has a gummy ship as well. And Leon says, well, Radiant Garden is our home. We actually came from here. Um, so, yeah, we've actually moved a few people who came from this world back here and we're going to rebuild everything. And Leon says this, well, once everything is back to normal, how it should be, we won't be able to meet each other because the world borders, the things that actually protect the world, they will be repaired. And even with a gummy ship you won't be able to come back. So it's just like... So we may never meet again, but we'll always remember each other. So then, Sora, Donald and Goofy leave for their final mission. They arrive at the end of the world. And basically, just when you see it, it's just an amalgamation of just barren wasteland in a sense. A load of darkness is basically corrupting this entire space. Uh, some stuff makes sense, other things don't. Uh, the Heartless here are more deadlier. They can, I'm not saying they can kill you in one hit, but they're very strong. Because, you know, it's the final world. Um, eventually they make their way deeper and deeper, because that's what you're doing. So as you're going through the level, you're actually descending further and further in. And then eventually you get to the final room. Uh, beyond this point, there's no light at all. There's just darkness here. It's either victory or destruction at this point. So they go through, and surprise, they're actually at Destiny Island as the final world. Sora and gang then try to go into the secret place, only for Ansem to basically split the island in two, and you have the final boss battle. You then defeat him and he retreats. You then have to face a dark side, which is the big heartless, which we saw as our first boss. Uh, you have to do that on your own. You then, once you do that, Ansem the Secret of Darkness comes back again, only this time you have to fight him on your own as Sora, not with Donald and Goofy. But then once you beat him, you then have the final, final, final boss fight. Where you're in the deepest, dark, you're in the deepest darkest abyss, which is supposedly where Kingdom Hearts, the name of the title, is actually yet found. It's actually a physical manifestation. Or at least, it's a fraction of it, at least. So... <clears throat> You, Ansem is in this huge monstrosity of a heartless. It's basically an amalgamation of flesh, dark things, and bleh, everything else. 
Golden Goof gets swallowed up by this thing, and you just because there's no gravity there. But then, when as Sora is falling, Riku comes into his head and says, "Give me up already, Sora! I thought you were stronger than that, or better than that." Sora then remembers while he was at Neverland, he gained the ability to fly, so he uses this ability to face off Anson Suit of Darkness. And basically, Sora beats him, and then it's in little stages. And so every single time you beat a section, you travel into the creature itself and you destroy the parts of it inside, and then you meet up with Donald and Goofy in each interval. The three of you then face off Ansem again for the last time that he fights you, and once he's gone, that's it, he's finished. But Ansem says this to Sora, kind of like as a bit of a remark, he says, The Keyblade alone is not enough to shut that door. Once I open it, not this isn't word for word, but once that thing is open and I get what I want, I will be unstoppable. So, it's like, okay, like from my perspective. Uh, he then calls out to Kingdom Hearts, fill me with the power of darkness, give me supreme darkness. So the door is slightly now coming open with like these black tendrils coming out. Sora turns around and says, nah, you're wrong. Kingdom Hearts isn't darkness because I know that it's actually light. And then when the door finally opens, a big, huge, well, I would say blinding light hits Anson the Seeker of Darkness. And he's actually surprised. It's like, what? That's actually in there? But why? Well, he doesn't get a chance to answer because he combusts. He goes... So then Sora, Donald and Goofy make their way up to this door. Now this door isn't small, it's, a f it's the biggest door in the world. And there, three of them are trying to close it, and it's not budging. Then, out of the blue, Riku appears, but this time he's actually on the opposite side of the door. He's not in Kingdom Hearts, because that thing isn't it, it's an intimidation, it's not real. And he says, listen, we can close it together, I'm on this side pulling it, you're on that side pushing it. But more Heartless are showing up. Mickey, King Mickey, finally shows up and helps Riku slay. Well, he helps he helps Riku by protecting him. And he says, "Listen, we're going to shut this door for good on this side and on and on yours, and we'll lock it together on two separate sides." Because Mickey has a Kingdom Key himself, which is the Dark Realms Keyblade. Now, when they both when the door finally closes, Riku tells Sora to look after Kairi and make sure she's safe. Door shuts. Sora and, Re uh, Sora and Mickey use the Keyblades, the door is sealed, the worlds are saved. Kairi magically arrives to where Sora is, and she tells Sora that she can't, that they care for one another, and that Sora says to her that, listen, I'll get back to you somehow. She says that he knows, she knows that he will, and then that's where the game ends. And then we get a little bit of a like, cutscene afterwards, where the island comes back, and everything else. And I think that's it. There, are, there is a secret um, trailer at the end, but that's probably something for another day. And that is the end of Kingdom Hearts 1. There is a load of stuff that I haven't probably mentioned because it takes a lot of time to explain. But just know this, that we haven't seen the last of Ansem, the Seeker of Darkness. He does make an appearance in the next game. Now, the next game on our list will be, once I have a look, is known as Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories. Now, I haven't mentioned about the final mix uh, variant of Kingdom Hearts 1, but I'll just go into a quick de uh, description. Um, a final mix is basically um, DLC, if you can call it that. So, but Back then, in the early 2000s, there was no such thing as downloadable content. So what happened was, when they redone the game, they had to re-release it with all the added features. So there was just another boss added, Heartless got different colour skins to show the difference between what was uh, a remix version or a final mix version of the game. And basically that's what it was. And there were like other bits and pieces added in. So like you got things either a bit more earlier or a bit more later in the game. Certain things were fixed, other things were left, and so on. And this is the same for Chain of Memories. Now, Chain of Memories is technically the true sequel of Kingdom Hearts 1. But it's not a numbered sequel. It's just something to bridge the gap between the first game and the second game. 
that makes sense. So, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I hope I try to keep everything informative as I can. And we will be doing this again. Uh, well, because considering this would be the 27th, we'll be doing this again next week. And yeah, so this is week one of the Kingdom Hearts uh, countdown video. I do hope that you have enjoyed. So if you'd like to leave a comment down, please do, because, you know, comments are good. Leave a like if you can, or even a dislike, because, you know, like or dislike to me is just, hey, at least you watched it. Um, also, if you'd like to subscribe, please do, because the subscription really does help. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah, there's a bell notification icon, isn't there, somewhere in the, near the subscribe thing. Because if you want to keep up to date with these videos, just click subscribe and there'll be a bell icon. Click on that and you'll get an email telling you when I've uploaded my next video. So I have been me. I have been Charles 1K92. I hope you have enjoyed this video. I can't keep on saying I keep on saying it, but I do. Um, hopefully I'll get to see you guys next time. Peace.